continuing our study through the book of 2 Peter. So go ahead and open your Bibles to Acts chapter 5. I got you, didn't I? Acts chapter 5. And uh, I also uh, want you to keep your place there in Acts chapter 5. And, uh, uh, and then turn to 2 Peter chapter 2. And uh, we're go I'm going to try my best to get through verses 4 through 9. All right, Acts chapter 5 and uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. Now, while you're turning there, I've said over and over throughout our series the importance as a church of studying and knowing your Bibles. It's important that we as a church be like the Berean church, uh, where they studied the Word of God on a daily basis. And uh, I've said that we need to know what we believe so um, we can identify false teachings. Again, the Bible says to study, to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman, it takes work, that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, or correctly interpreting the scriptures. I heard the story of a new pastor who decided to visit the children's Sunday school. So the teacher introduced him to the class and, and told the pastor, this morning, the children, we have been studying Joshua. And that's wonderful, said the pastor. Let's see what you're learning. So he asked the children, who tore, who tore down the walls of Jericho? 
Well, Billy was there, and he raised his hand, and he said, Pastor, I didn't do it. And uh, the pastor said, come on now, who tore down the walls of, of Jericho? And the teacher interrupted him and said, Pastor, Billy's a good boy. If he says he didn't do it, I believe he didn't do it. Well, the he was so flustered, the pastor went to the Sunday school director and told him the entire story. And the director, looking worried, explained, well, sir, we've had problems with Billy before. Let me talk to him and see what we can do. Well, really bothered now by the answers of the teacher and the director, the pastor approached the deacons and related the whole story, including the responses of the teachers and the director. Well, one white-haired gentleman, uh, part of the deacon board, looked at the pastor and said, well, pastor, I move we just take the money from the general fund to pay for the walls and leave it at that. That was a church that did not know their Bibles. All right. But uh, let's go ahead and get into our text this morning. Again, Acts chapter 5, where, and th this is where I want to begin, because we've been talking about false teachers. Now, we find here in Acts chapter 5 a very interesting story about some false teachers there in the first century. Now, as you know, Peter has devoted the entire second chapter that we have been studying to warn us about the deceptive practices of false teachers who claim to speak for God. But uh, here in Acts chapter 5, Peter, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 34, if you're there. In verse number 34, Acts 5. Peter and the other apostles have been preaching there in Jerusalem. They were spreading the news of Jesus' crucifixion, his death on the cross, and talking about his resurrection and how they could obtain forgiveness of sins through repentance. Well, the priest and the religious leaders, man, they got so angry at them for preaching that they put them in prison and warned them not to preach or teach in Jesus' name. It says in Acts chapter 5 and verse number 33, I think it is, that they wanted to kill them. That's how bad... Uh, that they hated them. And so they were plotting how to kill them. Well, one of the Pharisees, very respected, a man by the name of Gamaliel. Now listen to this. Look at the text. He stood up and he made a little speech. And this is what I want you to see because it ties in with our study. Gamaliel stands up to talk to the other religious leaders. Look at number one in your outline as I read it here. What two false teachers does Gamaliel mention in verses 36 and 37? I'm going to read it. Verse 34, Then stood up one of the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law. Go down to verse 35. And said unto them, You men of Israel, speaking to the religious leaders, this is so cool, listen to this, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do as touching these men. You're plotting to kill them? Here it is in verse 36 and 37. He mentions two names. For before these days rose up Theatus, boasting himself to be somebody, to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves who were slain, and all, and as many as obeyed him were scattered and brought to nothing. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee in the days of the taxing and drew away much people after him. He also perished, even as many as obeyed him were dispersed. So Gamaliel here talks about two false teachers one by the name of Theatus, who rose up claiming to be the Messiah. This is really interesting. 
Josephus, the historian who wrote during this period of time, he talked about this man. And again, Josephus said he claimed to be the Messiah. In fact, he told everybody to take their possessions and follow him to the Jordan River. And when they got to the Jordan River, they would know that he was the Messiah because he would part the waters and the people would cross over. Well, Josephus says when they got to the Jordan River, the waters didn't part. And uh, Luke tells us, and uh, uh, here in the book of Acts, that he had a big following. And uh, around 400 people were following him. So he was killed. And his followers were scattered and it came to nothing. But there was a false teacher during this period of time. And then the second one Josephus talks about is Judas of Galilee. He also had a big following. This guy, Judas, and you're going to finally understand why Peter is so upset in chapter 2 of 2 Peter talking about false teachers. Listen to this. Here's what Josephus said about Judas. Judas said, um, Judas said that, hey, you should not pay taxes to the Roman government. You have God as your Lord. And so Judas started a rebellion of not paying the taxes. And, and Judas founded a group that you'll probably recognize their name called the Zealots. And they even were guilty of murder and insurrection and it was led by this man. Now listen to this. What famous apostle was also a former zealot. Peter. He was called Peter the Zealot. Listen. He was partially involved, but he was saved out of it by Jesus. Can you imagine? Now, he knows the destructive damage of false teachers. Listen to this. Um, uh, today, did you know that there are over 500 cults just in the United States alone? 500 cults. People don't understand that these religions like the Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons who supposedly teach about Jesus, they're not teaching about the real Jesus of the Bible at all. Take Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Back in 1830, he founded the church. Did you know that the Mormons are the world's largest cult today with over 5 million members? Joseph Smith goes, uh, he, he, was, he taught that Jesus is the brother of Satan and that we'll all become gods one day. We'll all have our own planets, and our wives will populate our own planet. Get this, if you're a woman, your job throughout eternity is to become pregnant so you can produce as many spirit children as you can. You, ladies, you look forward to that? <laughs> My family is involved in Mormonism. It's tragic. Grown to over 5 million members today. One of the signs of a false teacher and false Christ is they say that usually God revealed something, something to them alone. That's what the difference is between Christianity and the cults. Joseph Smith received a vision from the angel Moroni who gave him some golden tablets, which no one ever saw, and he was the only one who could interpret them. It's crazy. The story behind, uh, the same is true with Islam, with Muhammad back in 600 AD. He said that the angel Gabriel came and visited him with a message from God. 
He was told that only Allah is to be worshipped out of the 360 gods of, um, gods of Mecca, which is now Saudi Arabia. Well, that's convenient. Muhammad's God was already Allah, and when he told his family no one believed him, that is, until he had an army standing by forcing them, and they said, okay, we'll believe it, and today we have Islam. Huge cult destroying people's lives. And, and, and today, you would think, you would think that false, you wouldn't follow a false teacher. The most recent example of a person who claimed that he was the Messiah is a fella, and I practice this, Jose de, I'm sorry, Jose, Jose de Luis de Jesus Miranda. That's his name. He is the founder of Growing in Grace International. Jose Luis de Jesus. There it is. He was born in Puerto Rico. He established his church in 1988. 2004, he announced that he was the Messiah, that he was the second coming of Christ. And he, here's what he said. I am Jesus Christ, the second coming of Christ. Anyone who doesn't believe in me will be miserable. He claims that, um, that uh, now you are no longer to worship Jesus of Nazareth but that I now supersede Jesus and uh, in order, and do you know what his cult members do to give their allegiance to the church, which claims over 300,000 participants all over the world? You get a tattoo of 666 on your arm. L look it up. It is frightening. His members will tattoo the number 666 in tribute to Miranda because he is anti-Christ and teaches that he is now the Messiah. Can you imagine? I'm sorry, instead of 300, he has a total of 100,000. He reaches a much larger audience through ra radio, television, and internet. You think it would be obvious that the guy was not Jesus when he that claimed to be greater than Jesus when he said to put 666 on your body. All right. People are so deceived today. And it's all in preparation when Jesus Christ returns and deceives, and not Jesus, but when Jesus returns and the Antichrist, which is on the earth during that period of time, he's going to deceive the world. He'll do miracles and people will follow him. We're seeing it so much today. All right, let's get back to our text. 2 Peter chapter, chapter 2. Now, I thought that that was interesting. You may not have thought it, but I, 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 I just... It makes this chapter come alive. All right, let's get back to our text where Peter talks about the awful doom and the punishment that awaits false teachers. Look in verse number 4. We looked at that last week. For if God spared not the angels that sin, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Now look at verse number 5, 2 Peter 2. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. I'm going to stop there. Now, <clears throat> as we learned, these false teachers that were in the church, they actually believed and taught that God is not a God of wrath or judgment, that God does not get angry, rather that He is a kind, loving Father who would never send a person to hell for their sin. At the end of my message, I'm going to give you some points of how to talk to somebody who does not believe that God will punish sin in hell 
or who holds to the doctrine of annihilation, that this is all that there is and we cease to exist. I'm going to get there very quickly. But let me give you these. So, in these verses now, Peter is building his case that God is not simply a God of love, but that he also will punish and judge sin. In verse 4, we looked at how God did not spare the angels when they sinned. Remember, he, he cast them down into the abyss, into the bottomless pit. Those are imprisoned demons. And we also have uh, Satan and the other angels who are free and who roam the world. Now, in number two in your outline, according to verse number five, look at it. What does Peter tell us God did to the ancient world in the days of Noah? What does it say? He brought a flood that destroyed every man, woman, and child that was upon the face of the earth. Did you hear that? He destroyed every man, woman, and child that was upon the face of the earth. Number three in your outline. Why did God do this? Why did He bring the flood? Well, according to Genesis chapter 6, it was because of the wickedness of man. Every thought of man was only evil continually. It was a world given over to depravity and sin. They had rejected God. We even read in the Bible that it says that God was grieved that He even made man and that it grieved Him that He would have to destroy human life. Man had so corrupted himself and it grieved God. And so God brought this flood upon the world because, look what it says in our text, upon the world of the ungodly, the last word in verse 5. It's because of their sin. What's he emphasizing? That God is a God of wrath and will punish sin. Again, he wants the churches to understand that these false teachers are wrong. God will judge sin and punish it. But there's another truth that Peter does not want them to miss. Look at verse number 5, number 4 in your outline. According to this verse, in verse number 5, who did God save from the flood? Well, of course, Noah, uh, a preacher of righteousness, and his family, which totaled eight. Now, I don't want you to miss the point. Peter is just simply saying to the church, though God is a God of justice and will punish sin, He's also merciful to those who turn towards Him. And what did God say about Noah? That he was a preacher of righteousness, that he and his family walked in truth, the Bible says. That they pleased God. That shows me that no matter how evil this world is, you can still walk in truth. Amen? Doesn't matter. There's, you know, no matter how bad this world is, you can still obey God. So Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And uh, number six in your out, uh, outline, I just said it. God said that he was righteous before him in his generation. All right. Now look at verse number six. What did God do to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? He turned, in verse number 6, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes. Number 8 in your outline, listen to this. Why did God destroy Sodom and Gomorrah? Well, in number 8 in your outline, it tells us why. It says that the Lord... Remember, he came to visit Abraham with two angels. And he said, I'm going to destroy the cities of Sodom because their sin is very great. Again, his hatred towards sin. And it was because of Sodom's depravity. All those in the city had gone into sexual perversion. It was the sin of homosexuality. Remember, I don't even want to talk about this, but... but the Lord um, 
is telling Abraham this, the two angels, the two angels, the Lord leaves Abraham after he discusses with him, and Abraham says, you can find ten righteous in the city, I won't destroy it. But the two angels, they visited Lot in the city, and all the men of the city came and said, bring out those two men that we may know them sexually. And what did God do? He struck them all blind, but the city was completely given over to homosexuality. And in our society today, we promote it as a part of our culture and lifestyle. And that you are not politically correct if you are against homosexuality or lesbianism or sexual perversion. How did we get to this place? It's tragic, isn't it? And it was because of Sodom's depravity. Again, God brought destruction upon them. And again, in verse number 6, look what it says. Now, look at this. He made Sodom and Gomorrah an example unto those that should live ungodly. All of these illustrations are examples that Peter is trying to communicate to the church that God will punish sin. These are examples. Now, as a pastor, I often meet people who argue against the idea that God will eternally punish those who reject Him in hell. When I, when I talk with them about it, they'll give me several answers, usually two that I get the most. And, and I just talked with someone the other day, yesterday in fact, well, I believe that man just ceases to exist. It's called annihilation. If man ceases to exist, there's no more punishment for their sin. <laughs> Jehovah Witnesses made that type of thinking most popular. And uh, um, usually, um, well, anyway, let me, let me go on because I only got like four minutes. And I, I need to give you... Uh, look at number 10 in your outline. I'm going to give you those points on how to talk to somebody. And so anyway, the Jehovah Witnesses are for annihilation. The other argument I usually receive is, well, listen, the death of Christ on the cross paid for everyone's sin, and so therefore God will no longer punish mankind, and you can live any way that you want. And that's pretty much the doctrine of philosophy out there in the world today. I usually say... I say, well, what happens when... And this, this really confuses them. I'll say, what happens to a person who doesn't want to go to heaven? And I, I put them flat-footed all the time. They, they him haw around. Well, you know, what's going to happen to them if they don't want to go? But anyway, all right. Uh, now, look at number 10. We're going to do this really quickly. I want to take a moment and to argue against annihilation or future punishment, uh, for future punishment, all right? Number 10, what could you offer biblically as an argument against annihilation? Let me give you some help. Fill in the blanks really quick. You can look at them later. You have, number one, the rich man that Jesus told this story. Jesus said it. The rich man who died and went to hell was in conscious torment, and there was no suggestion that the torment was going to stop. Remember the story? The second part of that, Jesus spoke often of people in hell as weeping and gnashing their teeth. I mean, if it's annihilation, why would they be weeping and gnashing their teeth? Again, spoken of by Jesus, which indicates consciousness. The third part, hell is said to be eternal or everlasting, the same as heaven. The same as heaven. Heaven is everlasting. You know, we accept, most people accept the doctrine of heaven as being everlasting, but not the doctrine of hell as being everlasting. But from Jesus' own lips, he said it was everlasting. Next, uh, next fill in the blank. The book of Revelation affirms that the devil, the beast, and the false prophet will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Revelations chapter 20, verse number 10. 
And then the last one, Jesus himself said that hell is a place where the fire is not quenched and when the worm does not die or that the body does not die. Again, speaking of judgment uh, of, of, uh, of hell. And so, if you want to know what my position is, the Bible clearly teaches eternal punishment in hell for anyone who dies without having embraced by faith the gospel of Jesus Christ. Peter did not beat around the bush. I want you to see the graphicness of this chapter that we have been studying. He carefully explains through these illustrations that God judges the ungodly and that He is loving and that he is merciful for those who will turn towards him. And then, lastly, um, he talks about Lot being delivered, and I can't wait to get into the story of Lot, and we'll do that next week. But look at number 12 in your outline, and I'm almost done. i got one minute and a half, so time me. Are you ready? Here we go. One minute and a half. Why do you think Peter was so hard on these false teachers to the church? Why do you think? Because of the... How do I say this? It is the eternal destiny of propagating f false teachings that endanger so many people of rejecting the gospel and their eternity to be spent away from God forever in a real place that is called hell. My family, a good majority of them, are in Utah as Mormons. I have half-sisters who died and missed the gospel because of the cult of Mormonism. It is damaging, destroying people's eternal destiny. And that's why Peter is warning. I talked to a young man last night. He said, I'm an agnostic. I said, oh really? You're an agnostic? So you believe that there's a God out there? And I said, may I tell you that the God that you don't know who he is I can prove to you that that God is Jesus Christ who loves you with all of his heart and I he looked at me and I said you're an agnostic but and I drew this big circle on his chest I didn't touch him I just went there's this big circle and you know you were made with this idea that there is a God and this emptiness and dissatisfaction only God can fill in your life and he loves you and I was here to tell you that this Jesus Christ loves you because if you miss him if you miss the love and look what he did for you if you miss that you'll spend an eternity away from God forever and he looked at me and wanted more conversation with me and I hope that we'll be able to talk. So it's my brother's neighbor anyway. And he has such a kind heart. All right, I'm done. Father, thank you for these truths. Help us to realize we can't get sucked into this thing that God is so loving that, that there is not a hell. Goodness. We'd have to reject the Word of God. We'd have to reject Jesus. And then we have nothing to hold on to. But bless these truths in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done.